Hey, you geeks. The Ouroboros symbol for the Wheel of Time is quite the conversation starter. In the real world, it can mean anything from Satan to just eternity. Yet, for how divisive the Great Serpent is today, it may be the only thing in Randland that everyone agrees on. The Great Serpent is just a symbol of eternity, and yet they never seem to think that Rand, the man with two serpents on his arms, is affiliated with the Great Serpent in any way. Thus, my driving question for this video is, could Rand be considered the Great Serpent? Spoilers for the entire Wheel of Time series. In this video, we will consider the various aspects of Rand and compare them to the Great Serpent stories we have today. From supporter of creation, to killer of gods, to the heart of Tarman Gaiden, to the dreamer. Support of Creation During the last battle, Rand enters the cave at Shell Ghoul, battles the Dark One, and does this. Rand pulled the Dark One into the pattern. Only here was their time. Rand yelled, thrusting the Dark One back through the pit from where it had come. Rand pulled together the rent that had been made here long ago by foolish men. Making him the one to bound Shaitan outside of the Wheel of Time. So according to the Westlands Catechism, he is the creator. The Dark One and all the Forsaken are bound at Shale Ghoul beyond the Great Blight, bound by the creator at the moment of creation, bound until the end of time. If Rand is the creator, then who is the voice who speaks at the Eye of the World, and before he enters Shale Ghoul. Well, I couldn't find any stories about snakes creating reality. A few cultures give snakes number one supporting role. In India, a great serpent known as Sesa holds the world on his back. According to the Asika Parva, he got the job from Brahma himself. Brahma said, O oh, Sesha, I am exceedingly gratified with this, thy self-denial and love of peace. But at my command, let this act be done by thee for the good of my creatures. Bear thou, O oh, Sesha, properly and well this earth. The other Ouroboros I could find at the bottom of the world is the Norse serpent, Jormungandr. Odin threw the serpent into the deep sea which surrounds all lands. There wax the serpent, so that he lies in the midst of the ocean, surrounds all the earth, and bites his own tail. Odin is usually affiliated with Matt in the Wheel of Time, and it is a very Matt thing to do, yeet Rand as far away as possible. Across the board, Rand, Seisha, and Jormungandr all seem to be put in their position by a divinity greater than they. Though, when all three serpents rise, the world will end, and all hell will break loose. Killer of the gods. Since Rand and Moradin's fates collided in Shadar Logoth, Excuse me, Egon. You said crossing the streams was bad. Cross the streams. You're gonna endanger us. Moradin's presence in Rand's soul first makes Rand violently ill. With Sidene came the inevitable violent nausea, the almost overwhelming desire to double over and empty himself of every meal he had ever eaten. The face of the man from Shadar Logoth floated in his head for a moment. He looked furious and near to sicking up. Then, aware of their connection, more than pulled on Rand's strings, convincing him to bail fire all the Forsaken. We are all reborn, Moradin continued. Spun back into the pattern, time and time again. Death is no barrier to my master, save for those who have known Balefire. They are beyond his grasp. Snakes and gods have a contentious relationship in mythology. In the Samudra Mathana, we see Sesa be both the god's tool 
and they're doomed. Remember when we did that one thing with that one guy? Oh, do I ever. During a war between the Divas, or demigods, and Asherahs, or demons, Vishnu advises that they use Seisha and the world turtle to hold Mandara Mountain to churn the cosmic ocean into nectar. The great mountain was then encircled by Seisha, and the divas and the Asuras took hold of the string. The divas took hold of the tail of Seisha, and the demons took the head ends. In some tellings, the snake gets so sick from churning the ocean into milk, he vomits. A very deadly venom shed thence bursting like a mighty flame. A pestilent poison came, consuming as it onward ran. It is sometimes said that it was Vishnu's plan all along for the snake to vomit poison and destroy the Asuras. It is also said that the snake is considered an aspect of Shiva, the destroyer. Notably for Rand, the center of this tale is a giant snake wrapped around a mountain being used as a tool by both good and evil to get what they want. This episode may also provide the source for the name of Land's horse, Mandarb. Sesa is not the only great serpent known for killing gods with venom. Jormungandr's story from the Prose Edda also seems rich as inspiration for the tale of Randolph IV. The Midgard serpent vomits forth venom, defiling all the air and the sea. He is very terrible and places himself by the side of the wolf. Thor gets great renown by slaying the Midgard serpent, but retreats only nine paces when he falls to the earth dead poisoned by the venom that the serpent blows on him. Both Moradin and the Dragon Reborn did die that day, though Rand cheated death on a technicality. In a way, his story does mirror Thor's, as both the hero and the serpent were slain on the last day. Both Seiza and Jormungandr were effective at killing their gods, but the Oliefeist of Ireland and not so much. Yes, Ireland, a land famous for not having snakes. I have had it with these snakes on this plane. Has quite a few tales of the creature. The most pertinent story for this video comes from the story of the serpent of Leodarg and a cave on the island in the center of the lake. The most popular telling comes from Rector John Richardson's The Great Folly and Superstition and Idolatry of Pilgrimage in Ireland, especially to that St. Patrick's Purgatory. Conan, another giant, the son of Finn McCule, finding a little worm in one of his jawbones, threw it into Finn Lau, where it grew so big within 24 hours that the whole lake could hardly contain it. This monster, called by the natives Karanach, would suck man and cattle into its mouth. The story begins like the story of Jormungandr, but instead of biting its own tail, I'm not really sure what Karanach did to men and cattle in their mouth. Remember, this was printed when S's were interchangeable with F's. Back to the story. Conan went to Naknachuni, a mountain near the lake, and was there swallowed up by the worm. When he was in Karanach's belly, perceiving that it might be wounded in the side, he cut his way through with his dagger. You ever hear the tale of Jonah? I wouldn't consider him a role model. This tale of breaking out of a great serpent with a dagger makes me wonder what Padon Fane's final battle could have been. Especially when you realize that Paden is the diminutive of the name. Patrick. Yeah, get with the program, Patrick. I mean, really, Patrick. I'm gonna stab you in the face, Patrick. And other versions of the story attribute the snake killing to St. Patrick. Some go so far as to call Karanach 
a goddess who St. Patrick ruthlessly murdered, subtextually implying that Catholicism is intolerant of pagans. Ironic, since Rector Richardson's version is meant to imply that Catholics are pagans. Interesting how one story can mean opposite things at different times. Anywho, aspects of the legends surrounding Lodurg also appear in the Wheel of Time's last battle, the heart of Tarman Gaiden. According to the Matsya Puranam, Sesa, like Rand, is tasked with finishing off the world. You mark the time of progress, cessation, unconsciousness, and the end of the age. You annihilate everything. You are Sesa. Likewise, the battle of Jormungandr and Thor ends the reign of Odin at Ragnarok. Though when we finally reach the last battle in the Wheel of Time, Rand wasn't out on the battlefield blowing up everything. Rather, he was in a cave doing spiritual warfare with Shaitan. It was as if the cavern were swallowing them, forcing them down to the fires below. The cavern ceiling, jagged with fang-like stalactites, seemed to lower as they walked. The cavern didn't gradually narrow. It just changed. No, Rand said, stopping. I will not come to you on my knees. This tracks with what has been written about Loch Derg, particularly the cave on the island in the center of the lake, which has varying descriptions. As a dreadful pit emitting flames day and night, as a cavern swept by icy blast from the netherworld, even as a mountain of sulfur continuously burning. This place is three feet wide, nine feet long, and high enough for a man to kneel but not stand upright. That's very interesting. The cave, now called St. Patrick's Purgatory, was a place for pilgrims, first Druids, then Catholics, to receive visions. Rector Richardson describes the chapel, which now sits on top of the cave, as displaying a figure of the serpent Karanach that looks like a wolf with a serpent's tail between its legs and thrown over its back. For Wheel of Time purposes, the story of this idol would provide inspiration for Perrin and Ram's roles at the Pit of Doom. I have been unable to find an image of such an idol, which isn't surprising since it's clear from the Follies text that Rector Richardson has never actually been to Loch Derg. Of course, neither have I, and to be fair, probably neither did St. Patrick. Yet the legends are very real. Is this real or a legend? Oh, it's a real legend. The poem of Sir Owain tells of the knight's pilgrimage to the site. Sir Owain's stay in the pit for a day and a night is foretold to bring him glory and balance on the last day. In the pain of purgatory and bought he have the better chance, at doomsday he is in balance. Owain's God in glory. This passage in particular reminds me of Nicola's prediction of Tarman Gaiden. The great battle done, but the world not done with battle. The land divided by the return, and the guardians balance the servants. The future teeters on the edge of a blade. The Wheel of Time's last battle lasts for a day and a night, all the while Rand is confined to the cavern until he brought about time's end when he pulled the Dark One into the pattern. It is here, at the heart of last battles, that Jordan pivots from Rand as the serpent destroyer to the keeper of time, confined to a cave. A dreamer who will wake at the end of time. Will Rand dream again? The Dreamer Back in the Eye of the World, the Dark One's plan was, apparently, to kill the Great Serpent. At least that's what Ishamael told the Ayil, who told the Tuatha'an, who warned Perrin and Egwene. 
leaf blighter means to blind the eye of the world, lost one. He means to slay the great serpent, warn the people, lost one, sight burner comes. This warning is taken to be a very literal interpretation of killing time. This is repeated again by Shamael at the beginning of the great hunt. Soon the great serpent will die. And with the power of that death, the death of time itself, your master will remake the world in his own image for this age and for all ages to come. The great serpent itself is never really mentioned again until A Memory of Light when Egwene mentions it to Fortuona in passing. Do you realize what will happen if we lose the last battle? The Dark One breaks the wheel, slays the great serpent, and all things will end. What they all agree on is that the great serpent means time. Known for eating his children, the Titan of Time is only slightly less well known for being chained in a cave and forced to dream reality. Kronos himself sleeps confined in a deep cave of rock that shines like gold. The sleep Zeus had contrived like a bond for him. For all that Zeus premeditates, Kronos sees in his dreams. Kronos is bound like Sesa and Jormungandr by a greater god into sustaining creation. Though Kronos is not a snake, but he is the father of Typhoon and Python. Both are giant snakes. Spiraling on, legend tells us that Patrick first saw his purgatorial cave in a dream. Thens be the wayful right, into in great desert. There was an old Mikael appeared that Grislich was of sight. Round it was about in black, in all the world no was his mac. So Grislet and Trin, when that Patrick ye say that sight, Swythe swore he was a flight in his sleeping. The dreams of this pit do not end with Patrick. Rather, pilgrims like Sir Owain went there and saw visions of heaven and hell, like my homie Dante, or like what Rand saw in his battle with the Dark One. But Rand's resolution, his balance, comes from a different source. The Yoga Kundalani Upanishad describes the primal life force in every person as an Ouroboros, That might be, according to Jordan, the greatest serpent of all. This is the balance foretold that Rand experienced holding the Dark One. This is why the Dark One's goal of killing the Great Serpent was not just to kill Rand. It was to kill Rand's ability to dream. Here is the truth, Shaitan, Rand said, taking another step forward, arms out woven patterns spreading around them. You cannot win unless we give up. That's it, isn't it? This fight isn't about a victory in battle, taking me. It was never about beating me. It was about breaking me. If Rand's dream dies, then the world dies. If Rand died still dreaming, then the world would live. Rand's tail weaves among all the world's dreams and binds them together in him. In other words, if we want to be super literal, the Great Serpent is Teleron Riyadh, the world of dreams. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe if you would like to see more. Your patronage is greatly appreciated.